New York City, 1895. William Randolph Hearst arrived with some grand ambitions. He just conquered San Francisco's newspaper industry and intended to do the same here. But New York was no San Francisco. It was the most competitive market Hearst could have possibly decided to enter. But he knew that. Hearst begged his mom to give him the money to buy a small paper called the Morning Journal. His mother, who controlled the vast fortunes of his late mining magnate father, was willing to give her son a chance. But the price was steep. The modern equivalent of around $5 million today. And those who were aware of Hearst's purchase at the time dismissed it as really, really stupid. The journal wasn't a prestigious paper. In a city with countless rags, each perfectly crafted to cater to every demographic, buying the journal seemed like a bad move. Hearst had overpaid just to get a chance to enter the city. Sure, he had found success in San Francisco, but that was in large part because he adopted the sensationalism popularized by Joseph Pulitzer. Out west, those tactics were exciting, a new wave that Hearst rode in on. But in New York, the top of the food chain was, well, Pulitzer. Her strategy here would just be to copy him in his own city. As far as most were concerned, Hearst was a spoiled rich kid from out west, whose only claim to fame was using his family's wealth to buy up talent and brute force his way to success. And I mean, you know, they weren't wrong. He would just find the best journalists, the best writers, and pay them more than their current employers. Sure, he wasn't actually making money doing this, but he could grow a circulation, and that's all he really cared about. But that same strategy can never work here, right? And, uh, yeah, he just did the same thing. And it worked. Not only did Hearst copy Pulitzer's style, he just stole his employees away too. It sounds slimy, and it was. But hey, Pulitzer's journalists weren't fans of their boss, and Hearst offered them a lot more money. Pulitzer was old, and going blind, or deaf, and he was just a pain to work with. Kind of a jerk. Hearst, on the other hand, was good-natured, jovial, and he treated his writers well. People just wanted to work for him. Now, this isn't to say Hearst just threw money to build a successful paper. He put in the work. If an interview needed to be done and nobody was around, he'd get on a bike, find that person, and interview them himself. He was obsessed with perfection. In one area he felt that he could really improve on were the comics. Comics were more than just the funny pages back in the late 1800s. I mean, they still were the funny pages, but they were actually really important to a paper success. You gotta think, in immigrant-rich New York, a big part of this market probably can't speak English well. Comics were just funny pictures. They didn't require extensive reading. And there was one character in particular that defined Pulitzer's comic section, the Yellow Kid. The Yellow Kid was just a bald kid. A bald kid wearing a big yellow shirt. Hey, wait a second. A lot of kids were bald in the city because of lice. So this bald kid was from the lower class, the immigrants, the poor. Hearst wanted his own Yellow Kid, so he just bought the cartoonist who made the comics. Pulitzer hired someone else to make new Yellow Kid comics. So now two papers had completely unrelated comics, both with Yellow Kid. And that's where the term yellow journalism came from. These two papers in New York City had the same Yellow Kid in the same style of journalism. Sensationalism. Now, neither Pulitzer nor Hearst created sensationalism, but they did popularize a very specific way of getting people's attention. Papers had always been biased in the past, while also informing people of the news. But in yellow journalism, the news was almost entirely irrelevant. Anything could be news. Yellow journalism was shocking headlines, colorful pictures, and broad appeal topics. Both papers focused on the fight between the underdog and the upper class. This was the Gilded Age. Everything was controlled by the trusts and monopolies. Political machines like Tammany Hall just ran the city. There was a lot of corruption to expose, but that didn't mean the newspapers weren't shady themselves, because oh boy were they. A price war erupted between the two papers. Hearst dropped the price of his paper from two pennies to one, now selling every paper at a loss. Pulitzer was now forced to match Hearst's price drop or lose a decent chunk of his audience. The funny thing was, Hearst's paper wasn't nearly as popular as Pulitzer's, which meant he didn't need to produce as many papers. Pulitzer was losing more money per day than Hearst was. Over time, the strategy paid off. The journal was starting to catch up to the world in circulation. Now, not really related, but Hearst had a thing for chorus girls. And one girl caught his eye. Millicent Wilson. 
There was quite an age gap here. Uh, Will was in his 30s, and Millicent was 16. Christ. Millicent's mother wasn't too convinced that Hurst was the right man for her daughter, so she only allowed the two to date if Millicent's older sister was allowed to accompany them. So Hurst had two girls with him, traveling across the globe on vacations and adventures, and that gave him something of a playboy image. Playboy image with a underage girl. God. Anyway, back on track, uh, around this time, a new story was starting to develop that Hearst was just captivated by. War. There was a rebellion in Cuba. The Cuban rebels wanted Spain out, and this was the perfect opportunity for Hearst to make money. Paint a picture of those underdog Cuban freedom fighters facing off against the evil Spanish Empire. It had all the elements of a good story. The public was soon outraged at the atrocities going on. They even demanded government intervention. Hearst even found an 18-year-old rebel girl and got his journalist to break her out of jail, brought her back to New York, and turned her into a public sensation. She even got a parade. And then the Maine exploded. The USS Maine wasn't by Cuba for any military action, but it did just happen to explode anyway. Seems like a pretty clear case of Spain directly attacking the United States. At least how Hearst saw it. The official investigation ruled Maine an accident. And even today, the best explanation is that Spain had nothing to do with it. But at the time, ooh. <laughs> Hearst wasn't having it. He wanted action. He wanted a story and he told the public to demand revenge. Go to President McKinley to send in the troops. Teach the Spanish a lesson. And so they did. Or that's how the story is usually told. This is probably Hearst's most infamous moment. The guy that supposedly started the Spanish-American War. Sensationalism gone too far. Yellow journalism sparking. Well, all of this. The funny thing is, this whole myth that Hearst actually started the war came from Hearst himself. Yeah, he loved the idea of people believing that he started the war. That he had that kind of influence? Wow. But he didn't, and he probably knew it. Hearst wasn't the only paper talking about Cuba. Like, everyone was. For years. All sensationalizing it. But Hearst just couldn't help but constantly remind people that he and he alone caused the U.S. to act. A fact that probably isn't true at all. The U.S. wasn't going to just stand by and let potentially easy victories slip away. Even though the war wasn't as easy as it probably should have been, but that's a different story. Hearst treated the war like a vacation, even while one of his journalists got injured in a battle. He presented his paper journal like an equal with the military. Not only had they started the war, but the journal was capturing war criminals, fighting battles, documenting everything. All exaggerated, of course. And being the humble man that he is, Hearst just couldn't help but start up another rivalry. The war brought attention to Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders. While the public was just learning of Teddy, Hearst was already well acquainted for many years. They both came from rich families, attended the same college, and generally held the same political views. Hearst knew Teddy Roosevelt, and he absolutely hated him. The war did not last long, but its effect on Hearst were permanent. Over the course of this whole conflict, the journal finally surpassed the world. Now Hearst was the undisputed king of New York papers. One might even say the king of journalism itself. Still, he wasn't content. Now that he had won New York, he started to focus on bigger things, like politics. Having control of this massive paper could give him a lot of leverage in any election. And Hearst was a guy who seemed to want it all. But he had a bit of a roadblock. The damn newsies. Yeah, those kids on the street, usually homeless orphans, the ones that pass out the papers. Those kids kept Hearst's empire afloat. If people weren't getting papers, well then, Hearst just wasn't making money. So here's how it all worked. A newsie would buy a stack of papers from Hearst, then sell as many papers as he could. If the newsies didn't sell all of them in time, tough luck kid, have to eat the cost. During the war, the cost of running these papers increased as you would expect. So to offset this, Hearst and Pulitzer put some of these costs on the Newsies, charging them more to buy up the papers. Everyone wanted a paper, so the Newsies were never left with unsold stock. But after the war, well, you can guess. With less demand, the papers decreased their prices for the Newsies, except for Hearst and Pulitzer. Their prices stayed the same. The Newsies weren't too happy about this, so they went on strike. This was bad PR, like a big business fighting against orphans. Not a good look, especially for two men who had made their image as fighting for the underdog. 
Hearst's and Pulitzer's own audiences were now going after them, so they had to back down. After this whole experience, Pulitzer somehow realized what he had became. Like, to beat Hearst, he had become the villain. Feeling remorse or concerned about his legacy, he distanced himself from the paper, focusing on philanthropy and charity. Hearst did not care at all. <laughs> what a man. Absolutely unfazed. He even used it as a springboard to get into politics. Sure, some didn't like him anymore, but the paper was still popular. Hearst managed to get himself elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1902. Still, though, he had much grander ambitions. Like mayor. He decided he needed to appear as a proper family man for the voters, so he decided to make Millicent his wife. One might say marrying a young chorus girl probably wasn't the best move for his image. He also changed his appearance. He had always come across as looking young for his age. He wanted to give some sense that he had matured. Wanted people to take him seriously, so he decided to dress, uh, seriously. Like a cartoonish interpretation of what dressing seriously would look like. All in black, black hat, black jacket, guess he thought he looked cool. People called him the Undertaker. His platform was put all those ideas he had fought for in his papers into practice. Eight hour work days, ending monopolies, and going after the rampant corruption. He picked a fight with some powerful people, and he lost. He lost terribly. You just can't beat Tammany Hall. Hearst seemed to believe that he had enough influence to expose all the corruption and clean it out. He never stood a chance. Tammany Hall just took the votes that Hearst received and literally threw them in the river. Then said, we win. I love democracy. This didn't end Hearst's political ambitions though. No, it strengthened them. If he couldn't become mayor of New York, well, he'd just have to become president of the United States. He was buying papers in LA, Boston, two in Chicago alone. He needed more national influence, but it was too little too late. He lost the Democratic nomination to Alton Parker, who then would go on to lose to Hearst's personal rival, Teddy Roosevelt. He then unsuccessfully tried to run for mayor again in 1905, and then governor. None worked. Why did he just never get elected? Well, the problem was, he had a past. His newspapers had written a lot of things over the years, and he made a lot of enemies. Like, a lot of enemies. It was all catching up with him. Also, apparently, he was accused of influencing the assassination of a president. Uh, years before, this article in one of Hearst's papers suggested that someone should just kill McKinley. And nobody really cared about it until somebody actually did. Oops. Some suspected Hearst had influenced the assassin in some way. Now, this wasn't true. The assassin never heard of Hearst's paper in his life. But the whole controversy brought eyes on his past. He was seen as a bit of a troublemaker. Someone who'd stir up problems for a story, and worst of all, maybe an anarchist. Hearst's political career came to a swift end. There's just too much baggage. And while he'd keep trying, he'd never win an election. After this, he decided to expand his reach in another way. If he couldn't be president, well, he'd at least try to be as influential as the president. Hearst was really interested in new technology, moving pictures, the radio. He bought magazines, theaters. The Hearst newspaper empire soon became the Hearst media empire. The very first media empire. World War I began and Hearst was in a position to once again profit. His journalists covered from the front lines and those stories were turned into newsreels shown in theaters. Hearst had created corporate synergy. For the first time ever, Hearst's newspaper, the center of his empire, was actually making a profit. Yet before this point, his mother was paying the bills to keep the business afloat, which is just hilarious. While she had considered giving him a substantial stake to his late father's fortune, her lawyers advised against it. They just didn't trust him with the money. Still, Hearst was building something to call his own. He realized that if you controlled multiple mediums, it could become something greater. Say there was a story written in his newspaper that could spawn a radio drama, and that radio drama could be reimagined as a movie, and his newspapers could give it positive reviews. Sound familiar? It set a bit of a precedent. Now, while all this was going on, in his pastime, Ole Hearst was still mostly going to see those chorus girls. Of course he was. This time meeting up with an 18-year-old Marion Davies. Hearst was 52. <laughs> Hearst had a plan for Davies. He wanted to turn her into a movie star. And so their affair began. Hearst wasn't very good at hiding it. 
Marion's face would be plastered over every Hearst newspaper and magazine. There was constant promotion for her next big movie, and his wife caught on pretty quickly. She didn't want a divorce. She was already entrenched in upper-class society and didn't want to give all that up. But their relationship unofficially ended there. His mom died of the Spanish flu in 1919. Hearst would consider this one of the worst events in his life, and he would never really recover mentally from this. But at least at the age of 56, he finally inherited the family fortune all for himself. Yes, even by his 50s, he was still given an allowance from his mother. They just didn't trust him with the money, and they were right. Hearst went on a spending spree, buying all sorts of useless treasure from Europe, all from the wealthy aristocratic families who needed money post-war. He collected things, just anything, useless things, fancy things, expensive things. He just liked things, like spending money on things. He was done with the old Hearst, ready to reinvent himself. And the best place to do that was Hollywood. Hearst decided it was time to leave old New York and go back out west. He decided to build a new house for him and Davies. Not really a house, uh, more like a castle. Inconveniently placed right off the California coast. Once it was built, he filled the backyard with imported random animals from all over the globe. Hearst's affair was an open secret in Hollywood. It was just kind of accepted and waved off. But back east, barely anyone knew of his infidelity. There was an unspoken rule by the newspaper owners. You could cover the personal lives of anybody, except for other news magnates. Nobody wanted their own secrets exposed, but a new kind of journalism was popping up. One exempt from this rule, the tabloid. The tabloid took sensationalism to a more severe level, just gossip and rumors, and they weren't afraid to expose Will's relationship with Davies. Hearst wasn't personally ashamed by this, but it did start to have an effect on Davies' reputation. It was clear she was only in these movies because of Hearst. The tabloids kept at Hearst. In 1924, Thomas Ince, a big player in Hollywood, was reported dead right after he attended a party on Hearst's yacht. Rumors began to spread that Hearst killed him. Supposedly, Hearst found him with Davies, or even more bizarrely, Hearst was certain Davies was cheating on him with Charlie Chaplin and tried to shoot Chaplin, but missed and hit Tom instead. It was all still a rumor, though. Officially, Ince died of heart failure. And yeah, Davies was certainly having affairs, but Hearst probably knew about them. He had bigger problems than a murder rumor. Those tabloids were winning. Even though the 20s were roaring, the Hearst empire wasn't. Davies' film career hit a slump. She had become an alcoholic, embarrassing herself and him at Hollywood dinner parties. But hey, things will turn up at least, right? Then the Great Depression hit. Yeah, a depression that Hearst and his financial genius predicted would only be a little hiccup. It wouldn't affect him at all. Even still, he didn't want to cause a panic, and told his papers to avoid mentioning the downturn as much as possible. Turns out the depression was kind of hard to ignore in the 30s. With less advertisers willing to spend on his papers, Hearst's empire began to collapse. He was approaching bankruptcy. But soon, a certain politician was giving Hearst a lot to talk about. Ironically, even though he hated Teddy, Will was getting pretty friendly with the rising star, FDR. Hearst was fond of FDR's New Deal proposals, and made sure to back him in all of his papers. When FDR was elected president, Hearst was convinced that he'd get some degree of input on the president's decisions for all his support. On the business side of things, this New Deal wasn't the only thing helping out Hearst. His primary demographic were those that benefited from the programs, the most likely to read Hearst's glowing praise of the president. Hearst's popularity increased in tandem until it didn't. You see, FDR did something that Hearst wasn't a fan of. FDR supported the unions, and so did Hearst, at a certain point. FDR, though, supported the idea of journalist unions. These were his papers, his pawns. How could FDR do this? Hearst considered this a betrayal, after all he had done to talk up FDR. So Hearst pulled a 180, started ripping on FDR, and that stupid new deal of his. It was a little bit of a miscalculation. Those readers still liked FDR, way more than they ever would like Hearst. Sales plummeted. To Hearst, FDR, and now his audience, were all betraying him. He had spent his life fighting for their benefit, and now in his hour of need, the everyman turned their back on him. 
There had to be something sinister afoot, a threat undermining him and society as a whole. Of course, it was so obvious, the communists. Hearst was hiring investigators to go after college professors to see who was communist. He went to Europe and had some meetings with, uh, uh, and those people had articles for his papers. His readers weren't all that happy with the change. There were already other alternatives, so his decline continued. By the end of the 30s, he owed a lot of money to the banks, the modern equivalent of $1.7 billion. For the first time in his life, he had to start selling things to get by. The collections he had spent decades curating were now being auctioned off to department stores. He was so strapped for cash, he needed to rely on a loan from Marion just to keep his business afloat. It was at this point he decided, with his empire near ruins, that he should probably get married to her. Small problem, he was still married to Millicent. Millicent was fine with the divorce, she just wanted one concession, the Cosmopolitan magazine. So Hearst had to choose, the woman he loved or one magazine in his vast empire. He picked the magazine. Of course he picked the magazine. Sorry Davies, she didn't take the news too well, which is understandable, I'd say. Uh, since they were already in Mexico for the supposed wedding, she just ran away, farther into Mexico. Hearst didn't see her for several months, until she showed back up at the castle, completely wasted. What a romantic reunion. Uh, they stayed together, surprisingly, unmarried, and Hearst kept the magazine. Things weren't going too well, and they were only gonna get worse. A movie was made, a film loosely based on Hearst's life. You might have heard of it, Citizen Kane. The movie doesn't explicitly mention Hearst, but it's very clearly about Hearst. Just a few details were changed. Kane's mistress was a singer, not an actress. Hearst childhood was drastically different than Kane's. Understandably, he wasn't a huge fan. Now, it wasn't because it made fun of him or showed him in a negative light. Details like his infidelity and failed political campaigns were all common knowledge. Orson Welles' portrayal of Kane was actually charming, charismatic, and if anything, made Hearst a sympathetic figure. Hearst took issue with two particular characters in the film, Kane's mother and his mistress. In the movie, Kane's mother is shown as weird, cold, and distant. She just kind of gives him up as a child to the bank, which was the exact opposite of Hearst's actual mother. And his mistress was this talentless singer who was only popular because of Kane. And by the end of the film, she's broken, penniless, and drunk, which uh, was probably a little too close to reality. Hearst refused to have his papers talk about the film, and kind of threatened theaters that showed it. Because of that, Citizen Kane ended up being a box office bomb. As World War II approached, Hearst found himself disconnected with the American public. Turns out his European friends were doing some, uh, things. But hey, Japan was doing bad stuff too, so Hearst focused on showing the evils of the Japanese Empire and Japanese Americans. Oof. Either way, Hearst's business empire was slowly being rebuilt. The war revitalized the economy, news was flowing, and even in his old age, Hearst had some money left. So he started going back to his old ways, renovating his castle, getting 73 dash hounds. All right. It wasn't the same. This man was in his 80s. There just wasn't enough time for substantial renovations or more pointless collecting. Hollywood had moved on. Him and Davies were old news. Hearst was old and sick. San Simeon was built far away from civilization as a grand retreat, but it also meant that it was far away from any hospital. Needing constant medical attention, at a certain point, Hearst couldn't even stay in his own home. He had to leave, a broken man. One of the final things he did in his life was to give a controlling share of his company to Davies. Marion wouldn't have much when he died since they were never married. This was his way of saying, hey, thanks for being there, pal. On August 14th, 1951, Hearst died at the age of 88. Marion wasn't even allowed to the funeral, being technically his mistress and all. The revelation that Davies had controlling shares of the company went about as well as you'd expect. Her sons were not happy. But Marion wasn't in this for the money. She herself would admit that when she first met Hearst, she was only interested in his money, in power, and ability to make her a star. But over the several decades they had been together, she did genuinely fall in love with him. So she ended up selling the controlling share to Millicent for one dollar. And then she got remarried the day after to a guy who looked almost identical to Hearst. Yeah, uh, that's weird. This whole story was weird. Oh man, I really want to watch this particular show. 
but I'm region locked because of my country. If only there is a particular virtual private network out there that might come in handy in a time like this. Where is he? Hey, where are you? What do you mean you aren't up for it this month? Yeah, I know you've done a lot, but that's like your job. You broke down my wall in August. What, what do you mean you're sending a substitute? What does that mean? Oh, that's what that means. If only there was a particular virtual private network that- NOR VPN Oh The sponsor of today's video, NOR VPN is a virtual private network which allows you to browse the internet safe and secure with your identity hidden and your IP safe. Choose from their thousands of servers in 60 countries to enjoy access to an internet without borders or restrictions. And you can use it with up to 6 devices at the same time. Block malware and ads with CyberSec. And with a strict no long policy, NOR VPN never tracks any of your data. Right now you can get a 2 year plan at a huge discount plus 4 additional months for free when you use my link, nordcom slash Alphist. It's risk free with Nor's 30 day money back guarantee. Wow! You know that actually works pretty well. I guess Cody's kind of expendable in these integrations. That's nordvpn.com slash Alphist or click the link in the description below.